the most beautiful things and they end up going somewhere else. Doesn't matter what they have, how much they have, how good, how rich, how beautiful, something about human nature is not satisfied and goes to the other side. People are tempted to adultery. It all seems so loving. And yet, what it's saying here is, on the outside it seems sweet, but behind it is actually death and hatred. At sin, it's destruction behind all of that. It says here, don't go this way, my son. And it can go, you can go either way, adulterer, adulteress, but it's the principle's the same, and it's greater than the, the issue of adultery. It says her feet go down to, you know, to Sheol, it says in the Proverbs, goes down to destruction. The harm of sin is twofold. Number one, it causes you to do evil. Number two, it stops you from doing good. And it ends up going against your own life because you were made in the image of God, so sin goes against the image of God. If you want to know God's will, one of the things of knowing God, finding God's will in your life, well, what is it? It's this, this, is How about stop the sin? You know, you want God's will, then first thing is turn as, seek to turn away from sin in every area of your life, and you will be walking in his will. It says here, do not go near to the door of her house. It shows you how practical this is. Do not go near the door of her house. It doesn't say just be spiritual. It says don't go near the door. Because if you, go near the, if you don't go near the door, you won't go near her or him. Stay away from the door. Forget all the complex spirituality here. Just avoid the door. You know, if you're trying to be the most spiritual person in the world, yes, we should seek it, but just stay away from the door. I mean, it's, it's some people will sign a counsel. Every time I look at a woman or I start staring at a woman, it's okay, stop there. Don't stare at the woman. Turn your head. You know, there's a story in the Arabian Nights. Something goes something like this. A young man enters into a room. There's an old man in the room, and he's miserable. He's a shadow of a man. Discontent. What's wrong? He's just weeping and weeping. What's wrong? He says, I can't tell you. He says, but whatever you do, don't open that door. The, that door is the cause of all my unhappiness. What's there, I cannot tell you, but it caused all the grief I have in my life. The young man sits there. Days go by. Finally, he can't control it. He's got to see what's behind the door. Opens up the door, enters in, and suddenly he, he's on an island, beautiful island, fruits, everything, peace, everything he could need, a mansion with servants, one day he goes into the mansion, one of the rooms in the mansion, and the servant in the room says, whatever you do, master, don't open that door. You can't come back. You know, try, you know, he goes to bed, but he stays up all night thinking, the last time I was told not to go through the door, it was better than here. So he goes, oh, you know, he thinks, well, it's got to be better than this. Hard to believe, but it's got to be better. Next morning he opens the door, walks in, couldn't come back, the door is gone. And sure enough, he's in a more beautiful land, welcomed as a king here, given a beautiful queen to marry, riches, treasures, a place with multitudes of servants there. One day he finds in his palace a room with palace guards. He says, what's that? He said, you must not go there, majesty. Whatever you do, you can't come back. He thought, but how much more rich and blessed I'm going to be. Suddenly, being where he was wasn't enough. Now he wouldn't rest. He couldn't rest until he found out the greater thing. Despite the being, being pleaded with, he opens the door, goes in, it closes. He finds himself back in the room with the old man. The two are now miserable together, spending the rest of their lives dwelling on what they thought they needed and now can never have again. Being all the more, ris more miserable because of that. The truth is, when you dwell on that which you don't have, you make yourself all the more empty and miserable. Drink water from your own cistern, and there's joy. That's the secret of the cistern. There's joy in your own cistern. Doesn't come by having, you think joy comes by having, I have more to rejoice in. No, joy is in rejoicing in what you have. You want your life to be blessed, rejoice in it. We spoke about, I touched on it on Friday, one of the secrets of joy. Give thanks and your fountain will be blessed. You've got a fountain. Be blessed in what you have. If not, you'll end up like that. 
You know, one of the things you do when you give thanks for what you have, it's amazing what it does for you. You sit down, if you ever haven't done this, sit down and write all the blessings you can think of in your life. You know what happens? You end up being filled with joy. And you didn't change anything. You didn't get anything more. You didn't have to get more in your life. All you had to do was you gave thanks. You were rejoicing in your water, taking water from your own cistern. And what did it do? It made you, you feel rich now when you thought about all the blessings God's given you. You feel rich. You feel content. You don't feel miserable. You're not frustrated anymore because you didn't realize all the blessings you had. That's your own cistern. Drink water. If you're single, you know, you cannot drink the waters of marriage. And you can't spend your whole life longing for what you don't have. If God wants you to be married, you just put God first and you'll get whatever he has for you. And you're not going to be happier for being married or, or not happier for being single. The one who's going to be happy either way is the one who rejoices in God and what they have from God. That's it. doesn't matter. You can be miserable single or you can be full of joy single. You can be miserable married or full of joy married. Drink water. Singles drink water from the well of singleness. And you'll be full. Paul was single and he was full. Fuller than, than most anybody else. And so with married, pe married people, stop looking at others. Stop comparing your marriage to others. Stop looking at, okay, well, this husband does this and you don't. This wife does this and you don't. All you're doing is drinking from another well. And it's poisoning you. Start drinking from your own. Start appreciating, blessing, whatever good is there. Even if it, it's a segment, go with that segment. And it goes in every way, this principle. We spend most of the present worrying about the future. In some way, driven by the future. I'm doing this, so I do this, so I do this, so, I did, so this doesn't happen. I'm doing this, I'm getting this, so, so I'm not poor. I'm doing this because I want this, I want this. And when doing all that, focusing on what you, what, what you have to get from the future, you, you are missing drawing water from your cistern of the present. Amen. You know, if you live, you live in the absence of what, you know, whatever you, you, you dwell on, you're dwelling, you end up dwelling in. Living in the absence of heaven instead of the presence of heaven. Even now, you know, the Bible says, you know, we, you know, we know heaven's coming. That's our blessed hope. But the Bible also says we are to, we are, the kingdom of heaven is now as well. We're to live in the presence of God now. It's not supposed to be that we're miserable with, the, with God in our life. God's in our life. The, the joy of heaven is not the gold or the harps. It's God. And that joy of heaven is in your life now. It applies in time in other ways. Some of you look back at your life and you're longing for what was a simpler time or you lost something or you had a marriage or you were abandoned or rejected or so you, you blew something and you look back, you look back at the, your, your past and you long for that. That is a foreign well. That is not your cistern. You cannot draw water from the past. You cannot draw water from longing for, to have what you don't have. That's not where God's going to act. God, you, cannot un, you cannot undo that, but in the grace of God, he can undo it in his way. And he will act now to make now the good old days. Now to be the time that these are the best times if you dwell now with God. It's not the past that was the best. It's where God is that's the best. You know, that's the way it is. It's like, oh, you know, when you were back then in the past, you weren't, you weren't saying, wow, this is the best time. It's only when you lost it you said, okay, now I want it. That's the way it is. And the same with now. Years later, this will be the good old times. But let it be the good old time now when it's not old. Drink water from your own cistern. Present. There are believers who were in jail for their faith. They didn't waste their time, the ones who were spiritual and the ones who were victorious, coveting what they lost on the outside. That's how you'd be miserable. You know, what are, people who are miserable saying, I, I could have had this or I did it. You're, what you're doing is you're drinking from a well, that same thing, that's what you're doing. But if you're drinking from the well you have now, you're not gonna be miserable and complaining. You've learned to get the joy from God because that's where the joy comes now. They discovered that prison floors 
have wells in them, God's wells, God's presence was in the prison just as well. And yet there are so many believers with so many blessings compared to people who are in prison and are miserable while they were joyous. Why? Because those who had, those who had the wells, if you have a well and you're not drinking from it, and even if you have a, you're in a prison but you are drinking from a well, you, the one who's in prison is going to be happier. Because I don't have this, I don't have that. The secret of joy, one of the greatest sins we commit is to neglect the joy and blessings of our own salvation. The joy and blessings of God's love for you now. And so that when, you, when you neglect it, what happens? That's when you start longing for the, well, you don't have, it goes together. If you're longing for other things, you're not going to be rejoicing in what you have. If you're rejoicing in what you have in God, you're not going to be so much longing for other things. And so you'll start coveting other things. If you stop rejoicing in the joy of salvation, that's when you start looking at the world. And you start looking at the internet for the things that you shouldn't look for. And you start looking in other places. Start coveting what others have, even what the world has, what your neighbor has. And soon enough, you, and the more you do, the more you lo lose the joy all the more on that. You know, somebody who's in an adulterous relationship, one of the things that often is a giveaway is the spouse notices there's a change. They're rejoicing less and less with the joy they have. And that's, that's true in everything. The more you go for these things, the more you'll miss the joy of the Lord. Imagine if you saw a man digging through, through a garbage to find food. And you found out the man's a prince with wealth beyond imagining, and you'd say the guy's crazy. But that's what it is for a child of God to seek joy from the world or other things. It's like a prince going through the garbage. And you say they're crazy. Believers long for all sorts of things. The latest trend, the latest move. Even in the Lord, you can, you can, there are wells that are not God. Even that. It could even be a doctrine, a movement in the Lord that, okay, now this is, this is the answer now. Years ago, 